So somebody is hurting themselves, and the, the, the word that's used here in Galatians 6 is somebody who is caught in a sin. It, it's like they are ensnared. Uh, when they're off guard, they got involved in this. And it's been compared to a fisherman getting entangled in a net, in his own fishing net. And he falls over the side of the boat, and he's hanging by the side of the boat, and he's in danger of grounding, but he's all in that net, and he can't get himself out. Somebody needs to help, all right? Somebody needs to help. And that's the spirit that we're talking about here, because this person is hurting themselves. Restore him gently. Uh, it has the concept of mending, repairing, uh, equipping, completing, or preparing just the same way that fishermen would mend their nets uh, to make them strong and steadfast again and to get out from uh, the trap. The goal is to mend broken people, to restore them to usefulness in the kingdom rather than ignoring him or throwing him out and saying, well, that person's all messed up. We might as well just let him go. And so we're so concerned about them that we're willing to get involved. Now, God often uses another person to speak words that a sinner needs to hear in order to repent. One of the most dramatic illustrations of this is in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And some of you are familiar with this account in the Old Testament. And that is when David has secretly sinned, first of all, uh, through adultery. And then when the cover-up didn't work, he had Bathsheba's husband basically killed in battle, right? So he's guilty of those things, and he thought nobody knew about it. And then Nathan comes, and he tells this amazing parable about a guy who had one precious little ewe lamb, and then there's a rich guy, and he has a bunch, he has a bunch of sheep. But he wants to provide, the rich guy wants to, to prepare a meal for some friends, and so rather than taking one of his own, he actually steals the sheep of the poor guy, the guy that has one little ewe lamb. And that's what he fixes, and it gives to the friends. And David is such a passionate guy. Talk about giving a guy enough rope to hang himself. And he just gets incensed that somebody could be so insensitive and cruel as to do this thing. And David's saying, tell me who it is and I'll take care of it. And what does Nathan say? Do you remember? You're the man. Whoa. And he says, God saw you when you took your neighbor's wife. And God saw you when you took your neighbor's life. And now, the sword is never gonna, it's never going to go away, depart from your house. You're going to know trouble, and your family is going to know trouble of unbelievable proportion because you've done these things. Now, I like to go on in that story because I love David's response. Because as soon as Nathan points it out and, and connects the synapse, connects all of those things, do you remember what David said? He said, I have sinned. The defenses were down, all right? He was confronted, he was caught completely, and he says, I have sinned. And Nathan said, and God has forgiven you of your sin, but the child that Bathsheba is expecting will die. Because forgiveness doesn't always cancel consequences. And that's why we need lots of grace in dealing with people and in dealing with our own issues along the way. So God will often use a person to speak words into the life of someone else, something that they need to hear because they're really hurting themselves, they're hurting others, they're damaging their relationship, and especially they're dishonoring to the Lord. Now, to, again, a lot of these statements require a little balancing out because this certainly is not a license to be a busybody and say, God has given me the gift to go out and point other people's faults out to them. You know, this is the gift that I have. And so if I pull you aside and say, I'm just doing this because God has gifted me with the ability to do this. And so we're just confronting people left and right all the time. That's called being a busybody, especially when we kind of have the radar out uh, looking at the sins of other people. And there are various scriptures that warn against the deal of meddling. Uh, and often when we're meddling to that degree, it's a sign of pride and spiritual immaturity. And that cripples our ability to serve effectively. And so when we find ourselves in a situation like that, it's probably going to be somewhat rare. This isn't the type of thing that necessarily happens all the time. But we're willing to step into it. And again, it takes courage and it takes grace in order to do this well. Now, once we're convinced 
that we need to care front someone, here's how we might go about it. This is kind of the nitty-gritty stuff, and I like it. I think Mark pointed this out to me too, but if you've read, if you're reading The Peacemaker, he, he takes the principles and he makes them really practical. He talks about steps to take, ways to approach this, and I think it's very helpful from that standpoint. Uh, and that means that you need to finally get to the place where you say, hey, could we get together at a time and place that works for both of us? Um, it may be in an office, it may be at Scooters, it may be at Starbucks, it may be wherever, but you're going to get together and, and just say, you know, there's some things that are affecting our relationship that I'm sensing, that I'm feeling, and I would just like the opportunity to discuss this. I'd like the opportunity to discuss these things with you. And sometimes they'll say, well, what about, specifically, what are we talking about? Well, sometimes it, you can give them enough of the gist of what it is that is of concern uh, so that they're not just trying to create all kinds of scenarios in their mind. But there's just enough in there to where they know, well, it has to do with this. It has to do with this situation. And I just, I, I really want to have the opportunity to talk with you about it. And part of the thing we explain by taking this and saying, you know what, our relationship is important to me. Um, the well-being of our church is important to me. And it's, so it's too important for, us not to, for me not to get some clarification and find some kind of resolution on the issues that are concerning me at this point. When you meet, you reaffirm how much they mean to you and your desire for an open, healthy relationship with them. Now, one of the things he says is, uh, you know, uh, ask if you can pray or both of you could pray before you start. And that just sounds like great wisdom, but I also want to engage in a little caution. And that is to make sure that the prayers that we pray are not self-serving. That we don't use our verbal prayers to kind of, you know, I'm coming to you as the righteous one and I've come to blow you out of the water and God is on my side. Um, so we have to make sure that we are honest if we have that prayer and say, God, we just need your wisdom today and we need to sense your presence with us as we have this conversation. And so that's a good spirit in that prayer, but be careful not to use, to, to, to wheedle your prayers as if there's some kind of a wheel that is some kind of a knife. Uh, describe the actions or attitudes which are of concern to you as simply and specifically as possible. And again, lead in words and phrases are very important. It seems like I've heard that. I've noticed. I could be wrong, but could you explain why? Is it true that? You're leading with questions. And by the way, that's always a good place to go. And that, by questions, I don't mean interrogation questions like an attorney on the hunt. But these are clarifying questions. We really want to know the answers to these questions and say, could you help me understand? And then when you ask the question, make sure you're listening for their answers, their explanations, and their perspectives. I have learned that people almost have, always have reasons for what they do and what they say. A lot of times we shake our head and say, why would anybody say something like that? Why would somebody do something like that? Well, if you take the time, a lot of times they'll tell you. And there's usually some reason behind it. Sometimes we'll say, well, it's just the emotion. Well, in some cases it may be. But a lot of times there is some kind of reasoning behind it. <clears throat> Many differences and offenses come from misunderstandings rather than actual wrongdoing. And that's fact. And so we're almost coming in with the assumption that we might misunderstand this. We, we may not have the, the accurate picture in our mind, but we want to get understanding to the best of our ability. Unless there is clear first-hand knowledge, we give the benefit of the doubt. We're open to the possibility that we could have this wrong. We could be wrong about this. And we want to project that idea. That's that openness about it, rather than coming with foregone conclusions. Um, assumptions that lead to accusations. Instead of doing those things, we ask and we listen to the answers. Um, and if by any fact, any possibility, as the conversation continues, you realize that you did make some false assumptions, 
that you did jump to some wrong conclusions, that you did level some unfounded accusations. What, what would you do in a case like that? What would you do? You'd confess. You'd say, I am so sorry. I honestly did not understand. I didn't, I didn't understand the perspective. And, and first of all, I want to thank you for sharing that with me, but I also want to ask your forgiveness for doing what I just did and jumping to conclusions without asking the questions and listening for the answers. I think so many of the communication issues that we have interpersonally could be solved simply by doing that, by starting by asking the questions rather than jumping to conclusions. And so we ask forgiveness for those things. Um, and then if in the course of that conversation, they say, you know what, I was wrong. You're absolutely right. And whether that is that, you know, we talked about the two kinds of sin last Sunday night. We talked about the mistake and the trespass. And sometimes when you see, I had no idea that I was doing that, but it was still wrong. And would you forgive me for that? And of course, we grant it. And in some cases, they may say, you know what? My intent was to hurt you. I was so angry with you for what you did or what you said that I want to get back at you. Now, when you get to that place, you know you're having a pretty honest conversation, aren't you? The defenses are down, and people are sharing pretty honestly. That's what you would hope for, that there would be that level of honesty between you. Now, sometimes not all of that can be taken care of in one meeting, and so you have to be willing to say, hey, maybe we should meet again. <clears throat> can we talk about this further? We kind of broke the ice. We kind of got some things out on the table, but... Maybe it would be a good idea if we gave a couple of days or even a week for us to continue to think about these things, give God an opportunity to give some wisdom and insight along the way, and then can we get together again such and such a time and place and continue on with this conversation to see if we can get to a place of understanding and a place of resolution. And then, of course, we always want to reaffirm our love for them. Uh, sometimes we can't reaffirm our like for them because, quite frankly, there are things about people we may not like. But, of course, love and like are two different things, aren't they? They really are. Ken Sandy also raises the issue of what to do if someone has something against you. Now, this is where it gets a little ticklish. Somebody has something against you. Somebody read Matthew 5, 23 and 24. I think it's really interesting in this context because I've, I've heard this applied a lot of times to communion. Before you take communion and you realize you've got to get right with somebody before you do it, it actually indicates from this it's more the idea of the offering or even a ministry that we're involved in. Before we carry few, through with that thing and we realize that somebody has something against us, we can feel the, the tension, then we've got to resolve to do our best to deal with that. By the way, it's not limited to whether the offense is justifiable or legitimate. It just says that I know that there's something wrong. I can feel the tension in our relationship, the awkwardness in our relationship, and I need to take the initiative to deal with that. We say, well, if they're man enough or woman enough, they ought to come and talk to me about it. But again, we're operating with grace here. We are sensing that something isn't right and say, I'm not sure what it is, but can we sit down and try to talk about this? And he suggests several reasons for this action. Uh, from Matthew 5. First of all, Jesus commands it. That's, that's reason enough, isn't it? Just because Jesus said to do this. It enhances our Christian witness. Uh, when we're serious enough about this that we're willing to make things right with a brother or sister, people in the community see this, I believe. There's greater peace of mind after facing complaints. Have you ever had these things rolling around in your head and you're not really sure what it is or what it could be and so you're thinking about it, you're worrying about it, but when you take the initiative to go and deal with it, uh, you can kind of get that off your mind and, and it opens the door for peace to come in then. We may discover sins that we were unaware of. Now I hate that part. But that's the reality is, right? That somebody may point something out to us that we didn't realize before, or at least we didn't realize how it affected them. It may help others see where their complaints are unfounded. If, if we follow the same process and we do the approach to them and they begin to share some of the things that they have heard or some of the things that they have seen or th some of the things they wondered about, 
it does give us an opportunity then, doesn't it, to respond and to give some explanation. And so maybe they're going to be able to say, oh, I had no idea. I had no idea that that was the situation. It demonstrates love for a brother or a sister and concern for their well-being. Uh, something isn't right between us, and I, I'm concerned about you as well as me. <clears throat> when we don't do this, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, those things are all serious sins that will separate people from God and incur His judgment. Something happens inside of us. Ephesians 4, 30 and 31. If we can get there. And that works both ways. I mean, it has to do with our forgiveness of somebody else, but it also has to do with their forgiveness of us. And that means that this bitterness can build up in their own spirit like a bile that gets on the inside and it, it messes up the stomach. It messes up the mind when that bitterness is there. And by doing this, it opens the way for a lot of that tension to be released. Uh, we want to get rid of that acid. Uh, we want it to leave them. And we want to be emotionally and physically free. And we want them that for those other people as well. And so that's why we would take the initiative we don't know what the issue is, but we know there's something. And we're not the one who has the problem. They've obviously got the problem. So I need to go with them. I need to go to them and say, can we talk? I need to know what it is that's separating us. Here are some guidelines for receiving confrontation. Again, I hate this part. Receiving confrontation or carefrontation from somebody else. Now this takes, <clears throat> it takes wisdom and patience and grace to handle it when we are being criticized, when we are being confronted about something, when we're being admonished even about something. First thing is we need to listen carefully. It's so easy to listen until we hear something that we can refute and then interrupt before they've had an opportunity to share everything that they need to share. And so it is to hear them out, listen carefully. Work hard at not being defensive or trying to win. How am I going to turn this around? Um, so working hard not to be defensive, to wear the arms fold and I kind of sit back and say, okay, give me your best shot because I want you to know that I'm storing up because I'm about to come back at you with my stuff. Again, this takes great grace. Ask clarifying questions. It doesn't help to confront back and start pointing out their problems. Could you explain what you mean a little bit more? I'm not sure I understand. Could you give me an example of what you're talking about? That is engaging in that conversation in an honest way. And this is something you do by faith. <laughs> Thank them for caring enough. Thank them for caring enough. Getting angry, stomping out of the room with a stern or a hurt look doesn't solve the issues. So somehow it is that grace that can actually thank them for that. And then you may have to say to them again, you know what, I need more time to process this. This is heavy stuff for me. Could we get together again in a few days or in a week where we can kind of have this discussion again. It's not all going to be settled. And by the way, a lot of times you've, if you've ever entered into one of these confrontation or carefrontation situations, sometimes when they go on so long, they lose their impact. It's kind of like I, I, I remind the elders, and I've heard this in different places, nothing good happens after 9 o'clock. And so we, you know, we meet and we talk for a couple hours, and then we say, you know what? Uh, we need to close in prayer, all right? We need to get together and pray about this. Because you can, if you talk on and on and on and on and on and on and on about this situation, you're going to get tireder and the defenses are going to fly up and stuff like that. And so wisdom often says, that this is a lot for me to handle. Can we continue this conversation a little bit later on? In some cases, it may be wise to get an objective mediator to help facilitate a confrontation. And that is when either the, of the parties feel intimidated by the other. Uh, it may be a difference in their verbal skills, a, a difference in their position of authority or their position of 
influence, but somehow the ground isn't equal, and if the issue is big enough. Again, if we're talking about a fairly minor, trivial thing that just needs a casual conversation, that's one thing. But if it's something that's risen to that place, then it may be good that we have to include somebody else to hold the conversation. And sometimes this happens after the initial attempt to, to deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. I think it's always good to start one-on-one, -on -one, but sometimes we may need to bring that other person in. This is especially where abuse has been involved uh, and the abuser might use the personal conversation to, mani to manipulate or silence the victim. It's usually not wise or constructive for a victim to approach an abuser. There's real danger that comes from that. Some of you are very well aware of that. Um, we need to, there's always dangers that go along with that. And so at that point, it's, it's usually good to include somebody else if actual abuse has taken place. How about that? Um, if the Christian is at fault in any of these situations, the church may have a responsibility to investigate, to confront sin, to promote repentance, to support counseling, um, to encourage people to submit to civil authorities. I think one of the naughties, we, we were in a church in um, Hood River, Oregon, <clears throat> that had not only a lot of Hispanics, but a lot of illegals in the community. And I, I want to tell you that proposed a real dilemma, because we had people in the church that were there in, in the U.S. illegally, on one hand, and on the other hand, we wanted to reach out and minister to everybody, right? Um, and the closest I could come to some kind of wisdom in that whole thing was to look at the book of Philemon with Onesimus. And remember how, how that whole story goes? Uh, Philemon the master, his, his servant Onesimus ran away basically from him. He escaped from his slave position. Paul, he came to Paul. Paul ended up leading him to Christ, and then he became a great asset to Paul. And so Paul said, I'm sending him back to you. And he basically is counseling Onesimus, you need to go back and make this right with your master. And uh, then he's pleading with Philemon, it would be great if you could forgive him, and then I'll, if there's any outstanding debt, I'll pay it for him, and then send him back to me, I'd love to have him on my team. But if that doesn't happen, we're free to do that. And the closest I could come in that situation was to say, if somebody's here illegally, they need to go back and face that issue. Now, that is, uh, that's a tough thing to counsel somebody, who, especially if they've been in the country for a while, and I don't want to get involved in all of that huge discussion, but I'm simply using that as a case in point, that sometimes in that whole con conversation, there may be things that need to be made right, and we need to encourage the person to make things right. In some cases, that's legal. Um, in some cases, they need a lot more, they need a lot more than a confrontation. They may, may need some uh, professional counsel to deal with some of the issues that they're facing in their life that are larger than what we can deal with in a couple of conversations. And the church maybe needs to be pulled in at that point or somebody in authority in the church who can uh, render some wise decisions when it comes to that. Um, when communication and trust has broken to the point uh, where they really can't hear somebody, they can't hear that other person, that's when another person may be involved. Um, I put together, and this is just kind of a basic rendition of something that I have used called a reconciliation and resolution worksheet. And I have designed it tonight specifically for the situation at Bethel. But if somebody was really going to work through, say, some reconciliation that needed to, to take place within the church family, this is what I would ask the parties, each one of them, to fill out in advance of a meeting that I would facilitate or in some cases, something that they would do to prepare on their own for their own conversation. And that is to think through very clearly, what are the main issues, problems, or incidents that need to be addressed and resolved at Bethel Church on the big scale? And by the way, I got a lot of those from the interviews that I had. I interviewed over 100 of you, and so I got some of those issues certainly out of the table at that point. But from an individual perspective where we're dealing with uh, disunity, or conflict, or division at Bethel? That's the first question that I would ask. From your perspective, what are the issues that, that we need to get out on the table that need to be resolved? And then a follow-up, and that is, in what ways might you have contributed to these issues? Don't you hate that question? I would much rather face this situation by saying, what did they do? Right? I'd like to point lots of fingers and say, what did they do? 
But in what ways might I have contributed to these issues, these problems, these incidents, my actions or reactions or attitudes along the way? Um, what solutions might you suggest to resolve these matters? What incidents or issues should be disregarded? You know, when there's conflict, and I, I've heard some of those stories coming from some of the congregation meetings that you had, where it kind of, the conversation kind of deteriorated to a lot more trivial issues than the main issues. And so then people start, start taking sides on the more trivial matters uh, rather than on the main issues along the way. And so what are the things that need to be addressed and what are some other things that we probably can disregard? We really don't need to, we don't really need to clarify at this meeting our favorite style of music, for example. Who are the people from whom you felt estranged and what have they done to cause this? This is where it gets down to the personal level. It's one thing that we're facing things congregationally, but then in the course of things, it may be, and I know that this is the case because I've, I've heard in conversations with enough of you to know that in some cases, friendships were strained. In some cases, friendships were dissolved. They were broken because they found themselves on opposite sides of the issues. And so who are the people that you feel estranged from as a result of what has gone down? And then again, asking the question, in what ways have you contributed to the estrangements, actions, reactions, or attitudes? What steps can and should we take to reconcile with these people? And again, what I've done when I've been in a facilitating role in these kinds of conversations between people who've been estranged, I have them fill a sheet like this out prior to our meeting. And then I review it and I put together an agenda and everybody knows before we have our meeting exactly what we're going to be talking about. There are no secrets. Nobody's going to be, come in and be blindsided by anything. We know these are the issues that we need to deal with. These are the things that we need to talk through. And my goal then as a facilitator is to help people communicate, help people listen to one another and make sure that certain things are heard and understood completely. Now, I, I know I kind of dumped a lot of stuff on you tonight. Are there any questions you'd like to raise at this point based on anything that we've talked about so far? Kind of a puzzle, puzzling question, situation that doesn't seem clear. I've either bored you or I've explained it so beautifully and complete that you have no questions left to ask. Okay, we're going to take just a little time right now. And I want you to discuss to begin with, around your table, what are some issues that you think would be important to schedule a care confrontation? What are some things that you might have to schedule a conversation with somebody about? And this, these are just examples, all right? Uh, examples of the kind of situation that comes up that you might have to have a difficult conversation with someone else. So just kind of make a list of what some of those issues are. And then what I'd like you to do is choose one of those issues and write out a short statement of how you might share it, how you might open up and share it with that other person. Now, when I talk about writing things out, it's kind of like we did last week. The idea is not that this is the method for doing this because what I have found that many times written communication, this is one place where it doesn't serve us well because people tend to exegete emails and long papers like they exegete the New Testament and they, why did this word get used and not that word and so it gets involved. So anytime we're talking about writing stuff out here, we're talking about it from the standpoint of trying to train and focus our thoughts. So that's, that's the point here. And sometimes in going into these difficult conversations, you may make notes for yourself, but usually writing out the long treatise as brilliant as you think that treatise is, in my experience, has caused more problem than it has solved them because then the issue becomes the way that it was said in the written document. And so we're writing things down to give our brain focus at that level. So we're going to take just a few minutes. First of all, what are some of the issues that would warrant a carefrontation? And then write out can a short statement of how you would share, choose one of those and how you would open in terms of sharing, getting that uh, conversation with that other person. So that doesn't seem hard, does it? Yeah, right. Okay. I uh, didn't give you uh, as much time as I wanted to tonight to really work on those statements, but I would be interested in just hearing some of the situation that you talked about. You say this would be worth a 
carefrontation. So what are the situations, some of the situations you talked about at your table, some of the topics that you'd say, yeah, that would be worth it. That's something we should have a conversation about. Gossip? Okay. Somebody? What? Miscommunication. Okay. All right. Anything else on the list? Lack of communication. Okay. All right. What? Avoiding. Okay. Okay. It's all seem to be communication. Do we have any uh, any felonies? Are these all sound like misdemeanors so far? But do we have any felonies out there? Okay. Okay. Yeah, Mark. Misusing God's word. Okay. 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 What about lying? Okay. I feel like we're still kind of playing softball here, folks. I mean, this is a big deal. This is something you're really concerned about. Anything else on your list? Distrust of leadership, okay. All right. Maybe distrusting the motives or the actions of somebody in leadership. It's easy to say, and I, I've heard a lot about that leadership, but sometimes we need to be a little bit more specific. Who are we talking about? Who do we, I, I'm not asking you to tell me right now, I'm asking, when, you, when we're talking about defining some of these areas, we need to get that specific. If there's someone that I distrust because of what they said or what they did or what I heard, then that would be worth that would be worth a conversation, wouldn't it? That would be worth a conversation. Anything else? Yeah, Laura. Okay. Okay. So it, uh, kind of flesh that out for me a little bit more, Lauren. Okay. 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 All right. This is the um, the project, and we're talking about this since we're not going to have time to do all of this here tonight. Um, but. If you're dealing with uh, a situation like this where you know there's a conversation that needs to be held between you and someone else, and again, this could be related to Bethel, it could be related to your marriage, it could be a friendship, whatever it is. Um, the place to start, a lot of times we have these things rolling around in our head. Pla a place to begin is starting to write things down. What are the issues that I'm concerned about? And being as specific as we can about this issue. Now again, this is not to send to them. And it's certainly not to send to them anonymously. Believe me, that doesn't help. But to send you know, in our own brain to help focus on that, to take that definitive of a step, is there someone, a difficult conversation that I need to have, and what are the issues that I really want to discuss? And then sometimes we even need to narrow those, the, the focus of those things down. But they need to be as specific as possible. If we just kind of, you know, kind of throw the thing out there communication or distrust, that's way too vague. We, we've got to get more specific about that. What incident, what, what am I talking about that happened that has caused me to feel estranged from that person? Something that I have against them. And then in the process of that, you may even start to say, what are some things that I may have contributed to that relational issue between us, to that conflict that is between us. Um, and certainly in some cases, as if we're talking about at the church level, it maybe is not, if you go back to the communication issue, not going specifically or directly to someone and having a rational conversation 
a loving conversation with that person as person to person rather than just having those feelings boiling on the inside and then, as too often happens, then talking to other people about them or shouting them out in an inappropriate way at an inappropriate time. So if we're dealing with that, we need to talk as specific as we can. What are the issues that I really want to bring to the table when we have this, conver when we have this conversation? Now, this is hard stuff. It's just easier to just carry your Bible and smile, right? And maybe it'll all go away. But this is, this is important stuff. Yeah, Ken. I think the group thing, thing is really hard to do. Um, and I think also, uh, again, this is my, my observation, not simply about Bethel and other places that I've been to, is usually it's not, sometimes the, the problem is no communication, and then a lot of times it's wrong communication. And it's the wrong place at the wrong time and in the wrong way. And that's where a lot of those letters, unfortunately, uh, become more of a barrier than they, they become a help in good communication. because. What we have is the need to sit down with that person that we're especially concerned with and say, could you help me understand? These are the impressions that I've had. These are the thoughts that I've had. And I want you to help me understand where you were coming from or why you came to this decision or why you took the action that you had. And that's very difficult to do when you're in a room with a bunch of people. Just my experience. Yeah. yeah. Your mind, your mind, exactly. And you know, eventually, when you when you're going to have that confrontation or that confrontation with somebody, certainly those are the things. That you're, you're, there are things in the back of my mind, and then I may communicate to them uh, and say, "Hey, Al, can you you and I get together for lunch? Because I've, I've I've been concerned about something that I've been seeing." or something that I've been thinking. And, uh, and then at that point, I may share what those things, some of the things I'd like to talk to you about. Usually, uh, the list shouldn't be so long that, you know, that it just kind of, there's no hope. It's just like being dumped on. So we, we need to kind of narrow it down. So what are the most important things? And these are the most important things that, that I'd really like us to be able to talk about and try to find some resolution about. But it begins with just for ourselves. Well, we can clarify. All right, well, there's lots of inquiring minds want to know. You start, you start with them. We always start with them. Um, otherwise, we can, again, there's, there's a lot of other things that can complicate it all kinds of ways. And that may be an issue that needs to be discussed with them, okay? But you always start, you always start with the person, unless they're an abuser. That's a, different, that's a different category. All right. Well, thank you for engaging. This is, uh, this is kind of the guts of what we're doing. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, communication. So we're going to try to get on the positive end. We're going to talk about speaking and listening. Two basic things, but we violate a lot of things when it comes to that. I'm going to ask again that you uh, get one-on-one -on -one with people around, somebody close to you, and just pray again for this thing to happen whether it has to do with our church as a whole or individual relationships that we're concerned about. Let's pray for, uh, for our church. And we want to come to the place where we say we're dealing with these things, but we want to learn how to do these skills. This is th these are skills. These are things that we do by faith. And we really can learn to do this. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do it. And this is what makes the difference in a church body. And that is when we learn to function like this and not... Oh, thank you very much. Otherwise, you'd hold that against me. I know you would, Craig. Uh, we have more copies of The Peacemaker. And uh, 
uh, that's there. By the way, we're still checking. I think we're, I think we're pretty close to saying that we've got copyright, that, that we're going to be okay on doing this. But we've been, we've been delaying, it seems like, in terms of getting the recording so that you can pick up those sessions that you missed or uh, even the ones that you'd like to kind of go over again. But part of the thing we've been checking into is to make sure we're not violating any big laws. And, and so we've got some professional opinion on that, and I'm pretty sure we're safe. But we're just kind of going that extra measure to make sure that we're uh, doing well so then that we can release those and not that we're not violating any copyright laws for uh, Ken Sandy or the peacemakers. It'd really be bad to violate peacemakers. I mean, that would just be a rotten thing to do, wouldn't it? Hey, find somebody you haven't prayed with recently and pray with them right now. Would you do that one-on-one? -on -one.